Of course, we know that card magic originates with uh, gambling uh, and card cheating, so uh, it's very appropriate when doing card magic to demonstrate uh, gambling skills and to do uh, what's known as a, a gambling demo or a gambling demonstration. Now, uh, there's nothing more powerful than being able to deal out some card hands from uh, a shuffled deck of cards uh, using normal procedures, shuffles and cuts that you would normally use in a card game, and that affect the outcome in some sort of magnificent way. So um, let's assume that we have four positions, uh, one, two, three, and four in this game, uh, four, four different positions with hand, uh, four different hands. Uh, and I want you to just uh, pick a number, um, one of those four, where you want the uh, very best outcome. Let's say you say three, okay? So again, the idea here is that through fairly uh, uh, normal kinds of procedures, through normal shuffling, uh, which is what you would have in between any round uh, in a card game, uh, normal shuffling, and then of course uh, a cut, the customary cut, and then dealing, just through that procedure, you would have some kind of outcome that would be fairly fantastic and beneficial to one person. So we'll deal out uh, just a game of a draw. This is a five card draw. So everybody gets five cards and they would be able to look at those cards and of course there would be some procedures in there for betting. Uh, we're just going to forget about that right now and take a look and see what we have. So you picked position three. That's this position over here for the winning hand. So let's take a look at the other ones. This is position four. This would be the dealer's position. Uh, and the dealer came out uh, pretty well. The dealer's got two pair. So two pair to work with, tens and sixes. Now, this would be the kind of hand that might uh, keep a player in the game. They might bet a little bit into this, so long as the betting didn't get crazy. They probably would hang on until the end with a hand like that. Um, position number one over here uh, has also a pretty, pretty good hand. Uh, they came out with three of a kind, jacks of a kind. So that beats this hand over here. Uh, and again, this person would probably hang in there. They might even bet into, into that hand a little bit, or at least uh, reciprocate if, uh, if some moderate betting is going on. Uh, position number two, let's see what they have over here. Well, this is not looking good. Position two has four of a kind. That's a very, very good hand. And certainly they would probably bet quite a bit on that, and they at least would stay in there and reciprocate on all of the betting that's going on. And you see, this is what a card cheat would do. Uh, if they are reserving a winning hand for a particular position, they would want to make sure that all the other hands look very good and that they would keep those people in and involved in the game and betting into, the, uh, into that hand. Uh, but as you can see, the position that you picked over here came out just a little bit better than everybody else with uh, four aces. Now, this is all assuming uh, then that the, the cards were, were shuffled and cut and everything was being dealt you know, fairly off the top of the deck. Um, now, perhaps consider for a moment, what if the, uh, uh, the dealer, or let's call them the card mechanic at this point, the person that's controlling the outcome, uh, was not merely dealing from a, a, a stacked deck that they stacked uh, during their shuffle. What if they were able to deal from other places in the deck, like the uh, bottom? What if that was possible? So let's let's try another let's try another experiment here very quickly. So again, you'll have the uh, customary shuffle. Uh, and of course the uh, the appropriate cut. And let's say we're playing just a game of Hold'em. So this is just a game of Texas Hold'em here. Uh, and let's assume that the dealer is going to give themselves the best hand, uh, and maybe they're going to be dealing not from the top, but from the bottom. So let's uh, put the uh, whole cards out here very quickly. So this would be one card to you, and then uh, one card to me. And we're not sure where that came from. And then one card to you, and then one card to me. Okay, so these are the whole cards. Let's just see how you're working out so far here. So you've got you've got a matched suit there, eight and nine. You have a little bit to work with. It probably would be worth staying in the game at this point and at least checking. Uh, you might, uh, you know, maybe bet a little bit, but just the, just the minimum. Uh, and then the next thing that would happen is there'd be a burnt card, and then you would have the uh, flop. So this is looking very good. So there's the flop cards. And at this point, you would probably bet a whole lot. 
Uh, you would definitely hang in this game here. Uh, three diamonds there, and you know that you've got two others. You already have a flush. You actually almost have a, a straight flush, uh, and there's still two more cards to come. So you, you're in this. You're definitely in this. Uh, and then there'd be another burn card, and then there'd be uh, another card, presumably dealt from the bottom. This starts to change things a little bit, but not necessarily for you. This is looking even better. You've got four diamonds out there on the table, and you've got two in your hand, and this just improved your flush quite a bit there, so you're definitely hanging on here. And then there would be, of course, one more burn card, and then one more card, presumably, from the bottom, which would put you out everything that you bet. So this is a good example of... Uh, card cheating, a gambling demonstration, uh, and a, a good example of uh, card control. This is going to be a quick discussion on uh, the gambling demonstration, uh, which is a, a type of card trick. Um, and I remember some time ago I was on the Magic Cafe and a question, which is an online um, forum for magicians, I I would suggest you check it out, even if you don't join to post, just to read through some of the various uh, uh, threads there. You'll learn quite a bit and get a lot of good reviews on some tricks that are for sale. I get a few pointers here and there. And if you've posted enough uh, for some time, you'll get some additional access where you can sort of discuss um, <laughs> various methods a little bit more openly with people. But I was on the Magic Cafe, and the question came up was, uh, what is your least favorite type of card trick. And I was really shocked to see the number of people that said gambling demonstrations were their least favorite. And I thought that was hilarious because if we're going to be honest about magic trick magic tricks with cards, um, there's nothing more fitting to doing tricks with cards than gambling demonstrations. I mean, if you really think about it, uh, doing anything else with a deck of cards, you know, literally being a, a magician that walks around with a deck of cards and does card tricks is really kind of strange. It's really weird. I mean, if you're a magician and you do magic, why cards? Why not do magic with everyday objects? And there's some people uh, out there who kind of call out that, uh, that aspect of uh, street magic or close-up magic, and they only do magic with close-up uh, close magic with everyday objects, and they kind of avoid cards entirely. Um, really, if you're going to be honest, the most appropriate tricks to do with cards is a gambling demonstration, because that's what cards are for. Cards are a gaming, uh, a gaming device. They are created for doing uh, various kinds of games, and particularly their history is games of chance where people are betting money uh, and uh, you know you get a certain you acquire a certain spread of cards that has a certain value and the person with the greatest value in their spread wins the game so um, it makes sense that card tricks that have a gambling theme to them would be very appropriate for a card magician to have in their repertoire. So I just want to talk a little bit about gambling demonstrations. Now, unlike some of the other uh, videos that I have on my channel, this is not going to be a comprehensive discussion of, of uh, gambling demos because um, gambling demonstrations usually, uh, really good ones, they involve a lot of slights. What I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you the common magician version of a gambling demonstration where you really don't have to do much at all. Um, in fact, there's really only one move uh, in this whole thing that we have to learn, and it's a really easy one, and it's probably one that you already know uh, to make this kind of a demonstration work. <clears throat> now, once I show that to you, I'm going to show you various ways in which you can apply just that one idea to um, what it would appear to be a number of other different kinds of gambling demonstration skills uh, when you in fact don't have those skills. You don't really need them to appear to have them. Um, <clears throat> a card cheat cheats at card games. A magician cheats at cheating, <laughs> if you can follow that. So as a magician, as a, a close-up magician working with cards, uh, we can cheat on the cheating and make uh, ourselves look like we're doing a whole lot more than we really are. And uh, you know that's a that's a good thing to be able to do as a magician. Uh, it allows you to really expand out your repertoire, particularly into gambling demonstrations, 
and make yourself appear to be uh, fairly um, uh, fairly adept at various slights that you may otherwise not really be able to do all that well. So um, first I want to talk a little bit about gambling demonstrations and just kind of break it down into the various types. And again, this is not a comprehensive discussion, but it's important, I think, that we understand how gambling demonstrations can be presented in the various formats that they have. Um, <clears throat> first of all, a gambling demonstration can be presented in probably one of two different ways. The first way is a demonstration in the actual play of a game. That is, that you are dealing out a game of some kind, a known game, uh, and you create an outcome in that game that uh, demonstrates that you've controlled the cards and you've made the outcome happen the way that it happened. You, you essentially predict what's going to happen or somebody else does and then you make it happen through your control of the cards. So that is a gambling demonstration where you're actually demonstrating a hand. You're, you're dealing and you're demonstrating a winning hand uh, in a particular game. One thing on that there are a lot of books out there that have gambling demonstrations, uh, uh, routines that you can find, uh, and a lot of them are very antiquated. There's many, many card games that just aren't played anymore, uh, and we have found in various localities that uh, cultures, current contemporary cultures, have zeroed in on really only one or two games, particularly in the United States. Uh, in America, you'd be playing Texas Hold'em probably most of the time. Um, we don't even really do five-card draw all that much anymore. Um, uh, a number of decades ago, a uh, five-card draw would have been the game of choice. Uh, and there would have been maybe uh, various stud games, things like that. But there's a lot of games out there that uh, magic books refer to in gambling demonstrations that we just don't play anymore. So it, I would encourage you, if you're doing a gambling demonstration where you're dealing out a hand of cards and you're demonstrating something in game play, that you're using games that people know. You're, you're going to be using the game that is very apparent to them that they can understand. Otherwise, the effect of what you're doing may go over their heads and may not be very uh, apparent to them and appreciated. So there's the winning hand uh, variation of gambling demonstrations, and that would involve some, some kind of stacking of some kind. So you're demonstrating stacking uh, and, and uh, uh, control via stacking in those kinds of demonstrations. The second kind of gambling demonstration deals with skills. It's a demonstration of skills, a, a skills demo. That is where you're not dealing out hands, but you're dealing uh, in such a way or you're or manipulating the cards in such a way that you're demonstrating specific skills that a card cheat would know. So some of these uh, skills would be trick dealing, that's second dealing or bottom dealing or dealing from center, um, false shuffling specifically, uh, so that is keeping a deck that is in full deck order or a known deck order, an obvious deck order, reds and blacks, or in order, uh, and shuffling the cards and then showing that the order is maintained. Um, false cutting, so you're cutting the cards constantly, you're having other people cut the cards, and you're still able to manage to keep uh, some kind of dealing pattern in play, or you're, be, you're able to demonstrate that the cards are maintaining an order. Uh, or control and location, such as an ace location. Uh, you're demonstrating card control by cutting and then finding aces. So um, uh, assembling aces uh, is kind of a gambling uh, demonstration. Uh, cutting to the aces is, is a gambling demonstration. Card cutting in general uh, through uh, demonstrating control is a form of gambling demonstration. Uh, it's just a skills demo rather than a, a card play demo. So uh, these are all things that I want you to consider in the formulation of your gambling demonstrations. And what you can do is you can piece together modular, in a modular way, a few of these different ideas and then come up with a, a routine that lasts maybe four or five, six minutes. Uh, and that is the one thing that you do in a presentation is just that one thing, uh, that one demonstration of skills, that one uh, routine that's been uh, uh, sort of uh, logged together, and uh, that, that is your show uh, for, for the evening. So um, I want to talk a little bit about a really easy way to put together a gambling demonstration. Uh, and it can be presented in a lot of different ways, but really requires only one skill, and it's a very easy skill. Uh, and if you have this down, you really can do just about, you can, you can pass yourself off as being able to do any one of these things that I talked about uh, just, by, just by doing this one skill. So 
Um, actually, one and a half skills. We'll, we'll say there's actually two things that we have to do. Uh, the second thing is very easy. The first one is a little bit more complicated. Uh, so let's get into it, take a look at what we need for a fairly passable and um, well-appreciated gambling demonstration for the common magician. Okay, so the one major skill that I want to teach you is a false shuffle, uh, and this is a false shuffle that I'm sure you know already. Uh, I probably have covered it at some time. I don't recall. Uh, maybe very quickly I've kind of glossed over it, um, but I want to more specifically look at it here uh, today. <clears throat> uh, and the reason why you need to have a good false shuffle in gambling demonstrations is because gambling demonstrations require the aspects of gameplay that uh, exist, and, and that would be two things, uh, shuffling and cutting. In every card game, you must shuffle the cards, and they must be cut uh, prior to the dealing of a hand. So you need to be able to do those two things in such a way that will benefit your outcome. Uh, and really, that's all you need. If you can do those two things, you can pretend to do everything else. You don't really need to be able to deal seconds. You don't really need to be able to deal bottoms. You don't have to have a clean uh, a sort of method of culling and control. Uh, if you just have a really good shuffle, uh, you know, a passable false shuffle and a passable false cut. If you do those two things, you can do any gambling demonstration that you want in some sort of uh, form or another. So let's look at an overhand false shuffle. This is very, very simple, very easy. Um, for this, we will take uh, the cards in this manner uh, so that your your right hand dealing hand is holding in an under biddle grip. So that is the fingers at the long sides, the long end of the cards. And then your left hand is going to cradle the cards uh, from the short side in this way. And then a real shuffle, a real overhand shuffle, is merely just thumbing off cards from that stack until you have changed the order of the cards. So you're thumbing off and you're dropping small packets. That's a, a normal overhand false shuffle. I don't want to insult your intelligence by going over this. I'm sure you understand that, but it's important that we cover what it really is before we talk about how we're falsifying it. So one of those very early basic false shuffles that you learn in card magic is the uh, falsification of an overhand false shuffle. This is not a completely blind one. We are not going to hold the full deck order. However, you can hold the full, full deck order. To hold the full deck order, you take off about half, and then you thumb off a specific number of cards, let's say eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You throw the cards on top, maintaining an in jog, or an out jog, I should say. You pick up the bottom stack, and then you thumb off eight cards again, putting them back in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that would maintain the full deck order. Now, if you're doing this as an offhand moment, and of course I've covered this before, but you're doing it in an offhand moment, uh, that would be a passable false shuffle. Now, under scrutiny, it would be very easy to call that out if people are really focusing on what you're doing. For our purposes, we're not going to do a blind false shuffle. I'm going to do an overhand false shuffle that retains a stock of cards. And this is the most basic one. We're going to re retain the top stock. And let's say we're going to retain the top half. Okay, so nearly half of the cards on top we're going to keep in the same order. So what I would do is I would uh, take off the bottom third uh, to give myself a margin of all of the cards on the top half. And then what I would do is I would uh, thumb off the first card and I would in-jog that card uh, towards myself. I got a good half inch on that. Then I would uh, fairly shuffle off, kind of sloppily, the rest of that third of cards on top of it. Now the next thing, and I, and I want to use, uh, when I do this, if I'm using a very small packet on the bottom, I want to make sure I'm thumbing off small groups of cards, only one or two cards at a time, <clears throat> because I want to make that third of a packet last a long time. I want to make it appear as though I'm running through much more of the deck than I really am. Now the next thing that I would do is I would pick up the whole the whole deck, and I would push forward with my thumb on my first injogged card, and that would make a break. I would maintain this quarter inch break underneath. And then what I would do is I would shuffle again, again trying to uh, shuffle off only one or two cards at a time to make this third last. And when I get to my last card at the break, I would just drop the rest of the pack on top. And what I've done is I've kept my top half of the deck in the same place, and I've only shuffled the bottom third. So um, it's a false shuffle, false overhand shuffle that maintains the full order of at least half of the deck in place. And what I can do is I can have a stack 
that's been prearranged in that area uh, that will be dealt out properly, uh, normally, without doing anything tricky, and it would give me a predetermined outcome of some kind. Now after doing that, I want to follow up with a false cut. The easiest false cut that looks probably very genuine is a swing cut uh, where you're swinging off, you're kick cutting or swinging, swing cutting off the top half. So you lift up with the first forefinger and you swing it over to the left hand. And then you take the bottom and you just set it on the table, pick up the top half and place it back on the top. So up to speed it looks like this. It looks very, very good. Now there's another uh, kind of false cut that's very similar to this called a tap cut. This is one that I've done quite a bit and I, I used to do a lot more and I'm, I'm trying to get away from it because honestly I don't think it looks all that deceptive uh, with this tap in there. I should say it looks, it looks deceptive, but you're swing cutting off the top, tapping the bottom on the top and then setting the bottom back down and putting the top back on top. This thing here and I've heard this criticism from a lot of people uh, over the years that this looks a little awkward. People don't really do that. So it looks a little flashy and awkward. So it really is probably, uh, excuse me, more, more appropriate uh, to um, just swing cut up and drop the bottom on and then put the top back on top. So even though this is more simple and it doesn't add that extra layer of misdirection and confusion, it probably does look a little bit more authentic. So a very, very simple false cut. So you have a false shuffle uh, retaining uh, the top half of the cards uh, by shuffling the bottom third on it. Re maintain your break. Shuffle down to uh, the break, and then swing cut, false cut, and uh, you've maintained everything that you need to for the deal. Uh, so those are the two skills that you, you need, and you can do any gambling demonstration, pretty much any demonstration of any kind of skills, without necessarily having the skills just by doing that. So the next thing we'll do is we'll talk about uh, using this in the demonstration that I showed you, and then using that same sort of sequence in presenting other kinds of demonstrations. Okay, so for the demonstration that I uh, showed you, you're going to need to make a stack. And this is a pretty involved stack. You probably, if you're, if you're just going to do a gambling demonstration uh, using a uh, top stock retention, shuffle, and a false cut like what I showed you, you don't necessarily need to be this complicated about it. There is a benefit, however, in the interest of demonstrating a number of different skills that you don't even have. Um, there's a benefit in probably being this thoughtful and complex about your stack uh, and having a few different layers uh, because you're able to you're able to, to, to take your your story I guess your your presentation in a few different directions uh, and, and appear to be a little bit more in control than what you really are so um, make this as simple or as complicated as you want this is what I did I start with my four hands that I want to deal out. Uh, my aces, four aces being the best hand, four queens being the second best hand, three jacks, and I put an indifferent card in here being the next one, and then uh, two pair being the next one. Now notice there's only four cards in each stack. I'm missing one card out of each. I have another stack over here of four indifferent cards that will be matched with any one of these, uh, potentially. Um, <clears throat> You can really only do uh, this presentation, what I showed you, with hands that deal with four important cards in the hand. So those uh, straights or flushes um, or full houses, uh, things like that, that involve five cards um, are kind of off limits for this method. Um, one of the things that I have in this uh, presentation that's kind of layered in is that I allow the spectator to choose who gets the best hand. And there's kind of a little bit of a layer to that in the shuffling that I'll go over here when we get to the actual uh, presentation of it. Um, but the ability to allow the spectator to choose who gets the best hand is going to require us to use four card hands. Okay, so I'll explain that here in a moment how that's going to happen. So the first thing we want to do is stack this, stack this up. Um, so what we'll do is we'll start with the aces. Um, as position one. So this is going to be stacked so that position one, uh, that is the first person dealt to over here, would get the aces. Uh, so first we'll put down one ace, uh, then the next thing we'll do is we'll put a queen on top of that, and then a jack. 
<clears throat> so the ace is going to be the... Actually, I got this backwards, excuse me. Uh, we want to go from the um, top through the, through the lowest. So, excuse me, ace is first, then we want to put a ten down, then we'll put a jack, then we'll put a queen, okay? Then we'll put another ace... Uh, and instead of putting a 10 down, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to put a 6 down so that we don't see so much repetition. And then rather than put a jack down next, I'm going to put this a different card in. Uh, and then a queen. Then we'll do another ace. Then we'll do a 10 against that 6 over here. Uh, then we'll do the jack. Then we'll do a queen. Then we'll put the final ace and then the 6. Then a jack and then a queen. So that is our stack. So right now, if this was dealt out, every fourth time around, a person would get an ace, one of the ace hands, uh, or they would get the two tens and two sixes, or they would get the three jacks and a different card, or they would get the four queens. Okay, so that is the stack. So it's the best hand followed by the worst hand, followed by the next one, followed by the second best, and then ending with the best. Okay? Um, on, on top of that, I'm going to take four indifferent cards. Now, if this was dealt the way it is, just the way, <laughs> the way it sits, um, a, the person, each person would get one of these indifferent cards in addition to the four cards that make up their hand. So that is the stack for the um, first uh, demonstration of five-card draw. Okay, uh, next we're going to talk about the Texas Hold'em stack, and then we'll talk about how to um, shuffle this and then deal it out. So the Texas Hold'em stack is going to be made up of three groups. The first group is going to be um, the Four Kings. The next group is going to be this flush, this not quite straight flush that we have. I, I used the six already. I think over here. Actually, the six might be in here. You could, you you, you want to, you don't want to use the six. You don't want to give them a straight flush because the a straight flush would beat four of a kind. But a flush does not beat four of a kind. A flush is really high. Um, <clears throat> it's one of the most sought after um, high hands in any poker game. People will are will very quickly try to chase a flush down because they're a little bit easier to get. For a high hand, for a high value hand, flushes are relatively easy to acquire uh, in, in a game, particularly like Texas Hold'em where you have community cards. It's a little bit easier to get a flush. So it's not unreasonable that someone would end up with a flush. The fact that it's nearly a straight flush just makes them a little bit more interested in it. Um, so that's what I did with this. Um, we're going to start with the uh, two cards. The, these two, we'll say we'll go with the eight and nine out of this and two of the kings. So any two of the kings. In my presentation, I used, I think I used my king of diamonds as one of my reveal cards to kind of make it look a little bit better for the other person. What we're going to do is we're going to take one of the diamond cards and we're going to stack that on top of my other stack here with uh, <clears throat> the four indifferent cards and then the rest of the cards uh, for my first demonstration. Then I'm going to put a king down. So this would be the um, uh, person opposite the dealer, and then this would go to the dealer. Then the next uh, diamond, and then the next king. So that takes care of the whole cards for both uh, people, the uh, uh, person, the, the spectator's cards, and then the dealer's cards. Next, we want to take from a stack of three indifferent cards and place an indifferent card on there because we need to have a burn card. This card is going to be burned uh, in the normal play of Texas Hold'em. The next thing we're going to put down is uh, the three diamonds uh, mismatched. Uh, they're not in an order, 7, 5, 10. They don't seem to make up anything. Uh, but they do make up something using the spectator's cards, their whole cards. Those will go on top of the burn card. Then we're going to place another burn card on top of that, another different card. Uh, and then we're going to place one of the diamonds. Uh, and I went with the king of diamonds next because it kind of played into that story a little bit better, um, seeing that next in the dealing. Uh, and then we're going to place another indifferent card and then the final king uh, in the stack. Now you'll note here that this makes up a good chunk of cards. It's nearly two-thirds of the deck. So in our shuffling, we're going to have to be pretty conservative in the number of cards that we take off. We're only going to take about a quarter uh, of the cards in our dealing. So this is the stack in the end. Now the first thing I want to show you is that the stack alone 
doesn't really look like it makes up anything at first glance. Um, it does look like there's a lot of high value cards in it, but there's a good mix of low value cards as well. So this doesn't really look like anything. Uh, it looks shuffled for the most part, unless you look at it for a long time, and particularly if you're looking here at the top, uh, it doesn't look like much is going on. Of course, these kings look a little suspicious, but otherwise it doesn't look like you know, it doesn't look like things are together. Things aren't grouped together in a way that would seem terribly suspicious. If I take the rest of these cards on here, which should be well shuffled, and I put those on top, and I spread this out, this really looks pretty benign. It doesn't look like anything is happening in here. If I give a very light spread to the top quarter, and then spread, this really looks genuine, because you're looking mostly at just these lower cards, um, you know, this looks like just a shuffled deck. Uh, if I uh, give a light spread at the top and then, you know, push and then light spread and push, you know, giving some groupings in there, this looks this looks completely um, unassuming. So, to uh, a spectator, I could have the stack and I can a stack and I could spread them out and I could say we have a shuffled deck. Um, and I could present it in a very benign way and say it would be very amazing for a, a card cheat or a magician to take cards that are shuffled uh, and then uh, from that do some shuffling and cutting and then give an outcome that is uh, beneficial to a player in a gambling game, in a card game. Now what I've done is I've very innocently assumed or made the spectator assume that the cards are shuffled when in fact they have not been shuffled. Now I'm going to immediately follow this up with a shuffle here in a moment, and that's going to um, play even further into their minds that uh, there's no stack uh, being played on them here. So that's the stack, that's how it's put together, the two different card games, um, and, and the way that they're set up. So let's talk a little bit about presentation of this uh, idea, and then after that we'll follow up with a presentation using the same concept of stacking and false uh, uh, shuffle, retention shuffles. Uh, to do some other, present some other skills uh, in card cheating. So this is the presentation of the uh, stack that we have here, as you saw at the beginning of this video. Uh, first of all, you would uh, uh, give your patter about card cheating and talk about uh, what a card cheat can do, uh, saying that a card cheat would be able to take any deck of, uh, of cards here, and then they would be able to uh, take that shuffled deck, and through only procedures that are normal to a card game, shuffling and cutting, they would be able to uh, create an outcome that is beneficial to a player. So let's assume, now what I've done in this, let me stop for a moment, what I've done is I've just made the spectators think that they're looking at a shuffled deck, as I talked about, but it's actually stacked. Um, so I, I mentioned shuffling, I showed the deck, you know, to the spectator, the cards are shuffled, uh, and that is a good place to start. So going on here, I would then say, let's assume that we have a four, a game with four positions, one, two, three, and four. Which position would you like to win uh, in this? And they would name one, two, three, or four. If they name one, you don't have to do anything. You can just do a retention shuffle, overhand, a uh, top stock retention, and then go on and just deal uh, with this being position one. And they would uh, get those four aces. If they say position number two, what you will need to do is in your overhand shuffle, you would take the bottom quarter, giving yourself a bit of a margin for the top two-thirds, and the first thing you would do is you would shuffle off one card squarely on the top. Now what this is going to do is it's going to make a situation where when you deal the first card down, uh, it will offset the winning hand of aces to position two. If they said position uh, two, uh, a position three, rather, you would deal off two cards first before you in jock. And this would offset by two positions so that the winning hand, the aces, would end up in position number three. One, two, and then they would be over here in three. If they said position four, you would shuffle off three cards first, squarely, before you in jog, and that would put the aces at position four. Okay, so uh, let's go back here again and... Um, Let's assume that they said a little bit differently from last time. Let's say they said position number two. 
So not position one, but position two. So what I would do is I would take my bottom quarter and then I would uh, shuffle off one card on top to offset to <coughs> position two, excuse me. Then I would injog one card and then I would shuffle fairly on top. So again, I'm, I'm only shuffling one card at a time to make my quarter last as long as I can. Then I would pick up and again, I've got a, some pretty good cover on this so they don't see how much I've taken and how much I put down. I'm going to pick up at my uh, in jog to create a, uh, a break. And then I'm going to shuffle fairly my top quarter again, just one or two cards at a time to try to make this last. And when I get to the bottom, I'm going to throw on top uh, the top two thirds or the top three quarters. Now I'm already set to just give a false cut, swing cut, or a kick cut. And then I can deal. So from here I can deal the first card down, which is actually an indifferent card. Then I'm going to deal here, which is going to be the ace. And then I can deal fairly freely. Five cards for each hand. <clears throat> now what I've done here is once I get to five cards, I've started to deal into my four indifferent cards that are between my top stack and then the next stack for the hold'em. Now, since I added one card to this, what I have left is three indifferent cards uh, to deal with. Actually, I'm sorry, uh, one indifferent card to deal with here. Uh, because I've used up three cards already. Um, so I need to be aware of that. If I add one card to this, I'm going to have one left over. If I put two cards on top, I'm going to have two cards left over to deal with. If I put three cards on top, I will have three cards to deal with. So whatever you put on top is what you have left to deal with before you move on to the next, the next stack. Okay, so I've got one card to deal with. I'll come back to that in a moment. My winning hand is right here, so this is going to be the last one that I'm going to present. Now, if I look around at the hands that I've got, I will have my lowest hand here on the next position, and then I would have the next best one on the next one, and then I would have the very best position out of three, apart from the aces over here uh, in position one. So when I present this, I'm going to present it like this. I'm going to say, you wanted position number two to win. So let's quickly look at position number three. You can see position number three has um, a uh, two, two pair which is pretty good, and you can go through your pattern just like you saw in my presentation. And I would say how this person has something worth betting on over here. They might stay in the game if the betting doesn't get too crazy. Uh, then I would say the next person over here, and each time it gets better and better. So this is, this is set up in such a way that it tells a story. We're headed into a direction. So I'd say the next person would have uh, a pretty good hand, which is three of a kind, three jacks. Now, they're not in order because I didn't stack them in order, jack, jack, jack. So I'm going to pick them out and place them down uh, so that they're together. So three jacks. Uh, and this person would beat the last person, and they would uh, certainly want to be betting on that. They would probably stay in the game. But uh, position number one over here, they come out really, really good. They've got four queens. Uh, and they would certainly bet on that. They would definitely stay in the game. But, but the position you picked, position number two, that's the one that has uh, the really, really best hand, which is four aces, and they would ultimately win. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, uh, that is what it can look like if a, a dealer were to stack a deck in their shuffle. Um, um, and if they were dealing uh, from the top, of the deck. Now you see what I did right there is I just dealt off my spare card when I'm talking about dealing from the top. And now I've set myself up so that the next card is ready for my next part of the stacking. Uh, now that's when we're dealing from the top, you would say. What if the uh, mechanic was dealing not from the top, but f dealing from some other place in the deck, like from the bottom of the deck? So for example, if we were to play another game, like a game of Hold'em, so again, we would want to uh, shuffle uh, very quickly, shuffle the card very fairly, uh, and in this procedure, what the dealer might be doing is they might be acquiring cards uh, that they would use. I just did my tap cut because that's why I've done that so much, I do it all the time now. Um, but again, you could do it just a, a swing cut. Uh, you would say that the dealer may uh, stack the cards that they want for themselves on the bottom of the deck. And you don't know what I have there, but let's just see what we've done. Um, so uh, I would deal out a game of Hold'em. So you would get uh, two cards, 
these are the whole cards. And uh, I've dealt myself, uh, potentially from the bottom, the cards that I want. So let me go over that again very quickly. <clears throat> I did miss an important aspect of this. When dealing, if you're going to present yourself as dealing from the bottom when you're not, you want to make sure it looks like you're dealing from the bottom when you're not. Okay, So you would deal probably something like this. And people probably knocked my presentation when you saw it originally. Uh, I was doing it intentionally bad uh, in, in bottom dealing standards so that it would look like I was doing something hard. Okay, And this is how you would want to do it if you were falsely presenting your bottom dealing skills. You would deal one to them, and then you would do this kind of strange move where you kind of turn the cards down uh, as you deal. And you want to be very quick and brisk about it, like you did something funny. Okay, Then you would deal the next one fair, and then the next one would go down like that. So you want to make it look like you're doing something hard, because you aren't. You're just dealing a stack. Okay, So I already have this sorted out. I've got my kings. They've got their eights and nines. Uh, you would go through the next bit of pattern where you deal off the burn card and then deal off the flop. And the assumption is that the flop came from the top of the deck. Then you would talk about how uh, they have a flush already, almost a straight flush. They haven't seen these cards. These cards are face down. Then you could say that you would deal a burn card and then maybe potentially deal one from the bottom. Now deal it face down and then turn it over. So it looks like you've dealt it from the bottom. Uh, and you could say, look, it's a, another diamond. This makes uh, your hand look even better. Uh, and then you can finish off by dealing one more burn card and then presumably dealing from the bottom, turn it over. That's your kings and uh, your demonstration's over. So <clears throat> as far as the spectator is concerned, you've demonstrated not only the ability to control a hand, two hands, but you've also demonstrated bottom dealing and you've done no such thing. Uh, we didn't do any bottom dealing at all. All I did was I talked about bottom dealing, and I looked like I was doing some bottom dealing, but I didn't. Um, so next we're going to talk a little bit about how we can maybe present some other skills using the same idea of a very basic stack, uh, false shuffle, top stock retention shuffle, and a false cut. So another form of gambling demonstration is just a, a general demonstration in uh, card control. Uh, so one, one way to do card control is to uh, demonstrate the acquisition of a set of four cards, like the four aces. So, for example, you might take uh, cards and, and uh, shuffle them up and then demonstrate that even from a shuffle, you can very quickly locate cards like the uh, ace of hearts. Um, Perhaps we could try that again, right? We could we could shuffle them up even more. And and what's happening here is I'm looking using various techniques and skills known only to card cheats to peak and acquire the position of these aces. So you can see you can see how this is is going, right? I'm, I can shuffle the cards, and what I'm doing is I can actually see the cards in a way that you can't. I can, I can see them as they go through the deck. And just through the normal routine of shuffling, uh, when I think that I've found a card, I can find and, and, and uh, present my aces. So, you know, you can do something like this, where you're just, all I'm doing is the same overhand shuffle, and I have all these cards sitting on top, and, uh, you know, present them any way that you want. Uh, so I'm just going through the same procedure, and when I get uh, back to the top of the deck, I do my false cut, and then I present the card. Right, And on the last one, I got to the end, and then I just shuffled one more time uh, the top card to the bottom, and then that allowed me to do to do this old maneuver where you, you, you toss the deck from one hand to the other, but you retain the top and the bottom cards, and you can present both at the end. So it, uh, just a basic demonstration of card control and shuffling can be part of a gambling routine or, or gambling demonstration. Um, so that's one idea. We already talked about a way to uh, make uh, uh, a stack look like a bottom deal or a second deal or something like that, some kind of trick dealing. Uh, I want to take this a little bit further. If you really are prepared on this, um, you could maybe do a, a demonstration like this. We have the four aces 
uh, hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs. And what we're going to do is we're going to place these uh, on the bottom of the deck. And I just want to demonstrate uh, bottom dealing for you. So it's important to have the right grip. Uh, and I'm just going to deal these out here and, and, and bottom deal them to, to a player. So, uh, of course, if I was uh, really uh, playing the game, I would want to deal them uh, to myself, right? I wouldn't want to give these away. So you can see right here in my own position, I've got my four aces uh, that I had. So I've bottom dealt them to myself. Now this is a good demonstration of bottom dealing that you could do, uh, you know, in, in common magician terms. It's not a bottom deal at all. All I had was four duplicates. So I had, you know, I had my four aces stacked in the same order as the ones in the bottom and I used four duplicates from another deck. So if you're, if you're really well prepared in advance, there's ways in which you could, you know, present skills that you don't have uh, using very simple means. Uh, and cheat on your cheating. You know, that's you, magicians are not necessarily card cheaters. You don't necessarily have to have the skills that you are presenting, uh, uh, you know, making people assume that you have. Uh, you can cheat on the skills that you're presenting. That's what a gambling demonstration is about, is a demonstration of skill. Uh, in, ex, in, expose, in expose, that is, you know, exposing the various different methods of card cheating uh, in a card game, um, such that it is amazing that card cheats can get away with that stuff. The very skills that they have to use are very difficult and very demanding. Uh, so uh, that in itself is a demonstration of skill. You can do this by cheating at cheating, um, just using a very basic stack. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So gambling demonstrations for the uh, common magician, various ways that you can go about doing that. Uh, and uh, you can kind of put together your own routine using a simple stack and uh, top stock retention, overhand shuffle, and a false cut. So good luck with that, and I wish you happy magicking.